That's the unconditional of the Father. His love is unconditional. It is given to anybody who wants it. That's why the hands of Jesus were nailed outright. It was the doors of his heart or the Father being opened up to us. And nailed open that the devil can't close those doors. Amen. And see, when he died, he had a crown of thorns, right? Can you imagine anywhere from an inch and a half to three inch spikes being jammed into your mind mm -hmm. through your skull? Because they were so long and thin at the end, they will pierce your skull. Okay? And he was nailed to the tree with approximately six inch nails that were the same way. There's only three nails, despite what some of these movies said. No, there's three nails. Six, six, six. He was destroying the ministry of Jesus Christ by the Romans, which is Babylon. Yeah. That's right. See how many things come? Interesting, isn't it? So he has this crown of thorns. And see, when you're nailed on the cross, you know, the reason two nails were, it, they, they put him in such a position that their knees were bent. Okay? So they could push themselves up because when they drooped, your, their lungs got cut off. They couldn't breathe. Okay? Yeah, that's why they broke the legs if they hadn't died yet. And sometimes it took more than one day for them to die. And if they were on there too, they were too strong, they'd come along and they would break their legs. So they couldn't push themselves up anymore. And so, and the nails were put in the wrist. They were pulled out of the hand. They put them in the wrist. There's two bones that come together here. There's an opening right in here. You can feel it on your own hand right there. That's where the nail went in. But at the same time, it's right by this nerve that goes through your thumb, which is also the one that goes down your back into your hips. I can't remember the name of it. Sciatic. Sciatic. There's a sciatic nerve right here. So imagine the pain in both of his hands and arms from that nail going through that nerve right there. See, they nailed his ministry wide open to us. And he suffered the pain for us. Hands represent ministry, the power of the Holy Spirit in ministry. The feet represents the dominion and power of the Father and the Son given to us to walk the earth like Jesus did. The crown of thorns was put on there because the battlefield is the mind. Eve, not a woman, no. She represented the mind. The battlefield is for the mind to seize control of your heart and keep you as a puppet. That's why emotional trauma, Jesus said, I came to find out the broken hearted. Broken hearted is emotional trauma caused by demonics. God will never torment us. Never. Never. But the devil does. That's what causes the broken heartedness. It's emotional trauma that you will not forget. It's in you. Jesus came to bind that up, to set you free and make you whole. Because those traumas are used to control you. And when you think about these things and they're brought back to your remembrance by the devil, of course, then what happens, unless you're going through deliverance and Jesus is revealing things, is it will be as though it just happened. Could be 40, 50 years different. It's as though it just happened. Especially in the pain of it. You will remember the pain. Sometimes you don't remember everything that happened, but you will remember how much it hurt. So these processes, that's why the crown of thorns. It's a wall of, wall of fire round about us and the glory in the midst of it. That's when he died, his head drooped. When his head drooped, that crown of thorns went over our heart. Became a fire. Zechariah 2, 5. For thou, O Lord, are a wall of fire round about us and the glory in the midst of it. That's the heart. Jesus is our glory. The Holy Spirit is the glory of the, of the Son given by the Father to bring us into such a place that we become His glory on this earth that all people can see is Jesus. Don't you find it interesting, and I do find this very interesting, I, I, I prayed and prayed and prayed, that when Paul was after Saul, because he was still Saul, Saul was after the Christians, he had a village of, of, of destruction, basically. 
a bill of murder from the Sanhedrin. Religious leaders. I don't think it doesn't take place today. Believe me, I know it will be true. Okay? And so, well, that's one of the reasons that God didn't make me a holy prophet. He made me also an apostle. He called me his beloved apostle into the church and teaching the truth of already how to use it. And they don't want that. But Paul had that in his hand, and he was on a horse, which means he had the authority to implement that piece of paper he had. He was in full control of everything. That's why the Lord appeared, because he was on his way to Damascus. The road to Damascus, Damascus, one of the means of Damascus is too tame. So he's on his high horse. That's where that term comes, right out of the Bible. Paul was on his high, or Saul was on his high horse, but he's about to get knocked down, didn't he? He knocked him off that horse, did he not? He just simply spoke. And there was a light. Interesting, if you read about it and study it more, you'll find out everybody heard the voice, everybody heard or saw the light, and yet Paul was the only one blinded. Why? Come on, you guys should be cheating and ask the Lord. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> Why? He was the only one chosen. Because it was about Paul, Saul becoming Paul. Saul means destroyer. He was from a town called Tarsus. Tarsus means the west. The west means the furthest point from God. Interesting, isn't it? What's the United States called? West. Why? Then? They call it the west. The Why? east calls them the west. Far from God. No, because we become a democracy. Making our own choices, voting in what we want, in regards to what God wants. It was not made, it was not created this way. It was a republic or a mirrored image of heaven. There was a time in this country you could not hold office unless you were a spirit filled Christian. Interesting. Why isn't this in the history books? Instead of all these lies that glorify murderers. There is. They will more readily glorify a murderer than they will proclaim Jesus Christ, who in most people's eyes was murdered. No, he gave his life. Very important. He gave his life. And then he took it back to give it to us. See, the Holy Spirit is life because of the blood of Jesus. You cannot receive the Holy Spirit and remain without the blood of Jesus. You don't have a blood covenant, which is a number five, by the way, not grace. Five is a number of blood covenants, which gives you grace. Okay. So, when you understand that the Holy Spirit is given through the blood, from the Father, through the Son, to us. Okay. Jesus Christ was the first promise. Galatians 2 says so. The second promise was the receiving of the Holy Spirit through the Son, Acts 1. So, in John 10 it talks about we have life and life abundantly. In fact, in John 16 it says you have joy and joy abundantly. In fact, if I remember right, it's also in 17 and in 14. So when you look at these things, and you look at John 14, if you want a good study, go in and read and study John 14, verses 15, 16, 17. And once you read that, go in and, and study John 14, the Father, John 15, the Son, John 16, the Holy Spirit, and John 17, communion for us. Back in 17, it says three times in there, Jesus said, I did not say pray, but I do not pray for the world, but for those the Father has given me. And by the way, that's a perpetual prayer in there. It never stops. Not just Jesus speaking, but it was embedded into those who hear, and God waters it and given to those who hear, and God waters it and on and on and on. This has been going on since Jesus was here. Perpetual prayer. So, the other side of the life abundantly is the Holy Father. That's why um, 
Matthew 3, 11 and 12, and Matthew, or Luke 3, 16 and 17, says, He that cometh after me, I am in no wise worthy of even tying the latches on his, on his sandals, basically. But he that cometh after me will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. It doesn't say Holy Spirit fire. It says Holy Spirit and fire. And it's in both those scriptures. The second scripture there, that's the first scripture, the second scripture there, and it says, and the fan is in his hand. He gathers his wheat into, in, into the garner, and he fans the shaft from them. Why? Because we got to go from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. When he moves his hand, what happens? Is it does it not create a wind? Okay? His hand is the fivefold ministry. The job of the fivefold ministry, and by the way, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was 13 8. That means he has not changed and neither has his word changed. The dispensation of time is man and the devil, Jezebel and Baal, fighting against its Jezebel and Ahab spirits to destroy the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit so we never ascend. And we're stuck in a rut of lies. Trying to make us blind. In the process of those things, Purim, this fits perfectly into Purim. Why do we fast and pray? Why do you pray at all? A lot of people pray, trying to manipulate God. 90% of all prayer is manipulation. Trying to get God to do something you want. Think about it. It's true. The Lord himself told me, the Lord, how can I? He says, look at what is praying. I've been listening for 25 years. That hasn't changed. We need to start learning to start proclaiming and declaring as a prayer yes. that Jesus Christ is whatever you want. And we need to start declaring, proclaiming, thank you! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1, or 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What, you, what evidence? Called hope. Called hope. We need to recognize that 11, Hebrews 11, 6 has a second edge to it. It's called verse 6. Somebody will look that up for me. King James, please. The other one's right. I'm sorry, the other one's boring things down. King James. King James. Hebrews 11, 6. This is the second edge of a fiery two-edged sword. Very, very critical. We all know Hebrews 11, 1, but 11, 6, I want it read exactly as it is because it's powerful that I don't want to mess that up. But it's the second edge of verse 1. Whoever gets it first. But 11. Okay, he's got it here. But without How, faith, loud, loud. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he had had come to God, but but he that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that delightly seek him. Diligently seek him. Diligently. Okay. But that's the reward. There's rewards in having faith. You want to live by your faith or do you want to live by the faith of the Son of God He gave you on the cross? By the Son of God. God. You understand? Galatians 2.20 I, I no longer live. I live. While I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave His life for me because He loves me. If you go look in, in John 3.32 He had the Holy Spirit without measure. That is also the faith that is in Galatians 2.20. He has faith of the Holy Spirit without measure. Amen. 
And which faith do you want to live by? What you think you have or what he gave you? No, what he gave me. You understand these scriptures now? Because you can go by the faith you want, Hebrews 11, 1. Or you can believe by the faith of the Son of God, Hebrews 11, 6. Which will become your reward. Because you will, because of that faith alone, the faith of the Son of God, the Holy Spirit will make sure you understand that he has granted this to you. And there's nothing too hard nor impossible for God when you have especially the faith of the Son of God working in you. The things that God is giving today is to convert us into spirit. We are spiritual. But why have we not converted into spirit? Why are we not translating by the Spirit of God like Philip? Do you know how big that story is? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, you know, the whole church, all I've heard since I've been saved is how bad Thomas was. How he didn't believe, he just, yeah, blah, 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 they ripped and tore this guy apart, and he's innocent. You know why he got accused of being doubtful, unbelief by man? It's because he was the only one that says, until I can put my finger in the prints of the nails in his hand and thrust my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it's him. Think about that. And by the way, that was on the eighth day. He wasn't there for the first meeting with Jesus. He was there for the second meeting. Eight days later. Circumcision of the heart is what we need. Now you see the two-edged sword going in and cutting away the stuff on the heart. That's happened in your lifetime. Because everything that's happened in your heart, it causes this hardness to build up around your heart that you would protect yourself. Because that's been your life. And all this hardness is around your heart. And it's only Jesus is the only one that can cut it away. And... When you give it to him, he'll remove it. Amen. He did it with me. And then as he cut it in, I saw my heart, and it was just glowing orange, reddish orange, because of the fire God in me. That he gave me. That didn't even do with me. Oh, the reason, thank you, Lord. Remember, the Holy Spirit can always bring back to your members whatever you, whatever the Lord gave you. John 14, 26 is true. So I just asked him to bring it back to me, Holy Spirit. So I just used that verse and he just gave it back to me. The reason that they went against Thomas was because Thomas reflected on the Holy Spirit and knew what to do to test who was in front of him. You can go by Matthew 7 about the rock and the storm. Don't build, you know, the sand. You know, don't build your house on the sand because the wind's going to come and beat it down, right? Go to Luke 6, okay, and find the rock. And Luke didn't just, Luke preached, he didn't just say just build. No, he said go make, dig deep and make sure it's the Lord. And then build upon what's on that rock. He didn't say build your own house. Build the foundation that Jesus gave us. That's what you build. How? And God used Luke to do that because he was a physician. He knew finite. He knew. That's why they went at, at, at Thomas. Thomas means Didymus, which is also a word of dunamis. They coincide. But Didymus means twin. Find that interesting? Or Christ-like. He was the first one to prove that Jesus was who he said he was when he came back. He's the only one that asked to thrust, put his hand back into the Lord. What happened with Adam and Eve? What happened with Adam? God put him asleep, put him in a stupor, right? As though he was dead, right? And then took a rib out and made a woman, right? So, and close the wall. Yeah, but you understand, I'm going to take you further than that. You understand that by Thomas, he was a rib being put back in to suck a man at him or to become one with God. 
Is she there? So you mean Thomas presents the ring? Thomas represents us being grafted back into Christ as his body. Members of his body. First Corinthians 12. We are members of the body of Christ. See that? He was granted as the first person there to become a member or the missing rib in second man. Men are missing one rib. So we never forget that what God did. And he was placed back in there. That's us. We belong in that position. Now Philip, he's the culprit. And he gets away with it in the church. Okay? Very important you hear this. Jesus is talking about his crucifixion, resurrection, all this, and he says, and, and, and he's talking about it, and he says, show us the Father. Hello! Boom! See, what was that old game that used to be on TV? Um, they, they, they came and did things, but they didn't like it, they'd hit the... The, the dong show. The dong show. Dong show. Yeah. Ding! <laughs> he had been out of there. You know why? By what Jesus says to him, he rebuked him. Thomas never got rebuked by the Lord. In fact, God was pleased that he did this. Because he represents circumcision of the heart, knowing who the rock really is, and then building upon what he gives you. He fulfilled Luke 6. Made sure it was the true rock. In that process, Philip was rebuked by the Lord and said, I have been with you all this time and you do not still, you do not understand. <laughs> now we get back to translation. Just like, just like Mary Magdalene, okay, had trouble believing, and yet who did God come to first? Mary Magdalene. But she was the only one. There's actually three Marys involved, and I'm not going to get into it today. There was actually three Marys involved with that, including Jesus' mother. Okay, there was an aunt, Magda, Mary, I mean, it's quite a story. So anyhow, and it goes along with Lazarus and all these other things. It's all tied in together. You just need the Holy Spirit to show you the spiritual, spirit and truth of the Word of God. Take you higher and deeper in the spirit realm. Okay, and there's much more. I just got a piece, that's it. But Philip... Even with Peter, look, Peter was the one who denied him three times. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah? And then what happened? He went hidden someplace and, and it says and he wept bitterly remembering what he just did. So what does Jesus do? They're out with, he got these eight apostles to go with him, including John, which shocks me, to go fishing. Because they were bored sitting in the upper room. Waiting on the Holy Spirit. True. Don't ever get bored. Just sit like Mary. Be patient. Wait on God. So what happened was they went fishing. They caught nothing all night long. And here's this guy standing on the shore. The sands of the sea. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Cook out a fish. What's in fish? Omega-3 oil. Did you catch that? Omega-3, the Godhead. Oil of the Holy Spirit. You got the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit right there in the fish. Hello, why do you think fish is all this all a miracle? And the bread represented manna or the living Word of God. This is all being done by the Lord Himself. He's putting things in order for us. Okay, Just like in the beginning, there was two boats that were fruitless. He sent them both out. He went with them, sent them both out. And there was such a harvest, it almost sank two boats. But in the end, there was only one boat. The first was the Old New Testament. He was, he was in the boat of the New Testament. In the end, there's only one testament that matters. And yet they were still fruitful. But they did catch 153 fish when they listened to him. That's when Peter, when John whispered to Peter, that's the Lord. Peter couldn't see him. Because he was out of order. He was out there without any authority whatsoever. He was not led of the Lord nor the Holy Spirit to go out there. He wanted, he was just bored. So he got seven others to listen to him, and they became disobedient also, and they were out there. 
in disobedience, rebellion. That's why I'm surprised John was there. But yet at the same time, God needed him there to tell Peter to open up Peter's eyes by whispering in his ears. That's the Lord. And then Peter opened his eyes a little bit. Wow. What's the first thing that happened when he saw the Lord? What was the first thing that happened when, they, when Peter saw the Lord? He realized he was naked. Cover himself, jump he had no covering. He was out there without any covering. Do you know how many people in the church go out and do things just because they want to or they believe they should and they have no protection? Other than the fact that God is patient and long-suffering and grants grace while we learn. But that's why they're not fruitful and if they are, it's very little. So the Lord yells and says, Hey, so what Peter do? He threw on a coat, a cloth, and then jumped in the river or the lake, or sea and swam to him. So they did what he said and they threw the blood over and they caught 153 fish. We recently, we, when God sent us to Israel, and he did, we're very grateful that God sent us there for a honeymoon. So we got to go to Israel. And for 23 years, I've been asking the Lord, what does the 153 mean? And I mean, I looked in books. I searched. I, I did everything I could to find out. And God would never let me. The, the man who was our guide was missing as a Jew. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Boy, could he, boy, just listening to him. Oh, my gosh. Sean let the world. This man was so full of wisdom and revelation. It was amazing what the Holy Spirit did with him. He would tell us mysteries that were just amazing. And he, God answered my question to him. The 153 in Hebrew represents I am God. Jesus ordered them to throw the net on the right side. What's on the right side? The sheep. I am God. They couldn't get the net in the boat. To meet fish. So they drug it. And then Peter, he runs out to help them get it in. Pull it on the shore, yeah. And then they Count sat down. One, then they two, sat down, and what happened? They had communion together. And that's when Jesus restored Peter for the three times that he denied the Lord before the crucifixion. He denied the Lord during it. And and God re restored him. Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, they feed my lambs. They're the most vulnerable. They're brand new. They're filled with Holy Spirit and fire. And the church is going to put it out. Believe me, I know. I met prodigals everywhere I went. And depending on the region you're in, I was in, it would be anywhere from one to three people in four were prodigals. Pushed out of the church because they were on fire for God. And they didn't want that fire in there because it was the Holy Spirit. And it converts people. It opens the eyes. So they're no longer blind. That's what the fire was for. To consume the veils of the mind and the scales that are on the eyes. Which is what happened to Saul, who became Paul. By who? A simple disciple. Who didn't want to go because he knew he was a murderer. And yet he was the person to tell God can use a simple disciple to go to Paul, Saul, and Paul and be used to convert. Open the eyes. Why can't he use you? Or me for that matter. So anyhow, Peter gets restored. The second time he says, Peter, you love me? He says, yes, he's getting a little upset now because Peter had a real bad temper, which God was about to deliver him of. Not completely though, because he still had a face-to-face -face with Paul. But the second time he says, feed my sheep. He did it again. Peter, do you love me? He says, yeah, Lord, you know I do. Then feed my sheep. Who are the two sheeps? Why do you just say, feed my sheep? Jews. The second sheep of the Gentiles. And that was Paul's ministry. To safeguard the new Christians, raise them up rightly, and protect them while they learn what they have. So until the Holy Spirit gets a good grip on them. And they trust Him, not you. Our job is to raise them up in their joy, in their faith, to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, and no man or woman. That's our job. It's also in Acts 27 or 28. 
And in 2 Corinthians 1 21, it says, Do not, we do not lord over their faith. And that's exactly what's happened to the church as a whole. As a whole. So here's Peter, he gets restored. Okay, so now we're back to Phil again. So here's Philip. He's asking the Lord to teach him about the Holy, about the Father who has been, he's talked to him for three years over this. So plus, Thomas gets the rap that Phil should have got, but they can't accuse Philip because it's too blatant. And he doesn't mean twin or Christ-like, which is what God wants of us. So you see the conspiracy in all this? It's very real. It's called religion. I didn't say truth, I said religion. And it's nothing but watered down, twisted lies of what the truth really is. When you understand Ananias the fire, Ananias represents the heart. That's why Jesus was the second man. Adam. Not Ananias, Adam. He was the second man, Adam, because he came to give us a spiritual heart. We don't want the heart of David. But we learn to grow up in that, that we obey God. But we want the heart of Jesus, which is one in the New Testament, is the key of David. Okay? It's Jesus' spiritual heart in us. Then you understand what Jesus did. When you get that heart, I guarantee you, you will understand a lot more about Jesus Christ, why he came here, and what he came here to do. So, Eve represents the mind. Okay? So, it had nothing to do with male or female. You know, but even though there was a physical thing going on, we need to look in the spirit of things. We need to ask God to teach us spiritually what the Word of God is saying physically. Okay? And in between the physical and the spirit is the emotions. That's why Jesus said, I came to bind up the brokenheartedness, which is the emotions, which is used to attack us demonically, to make us puppets. They can use that at any time to keep us from something. It can become a web. It can, it's a whip. I pray against um, uh, marionette and you know the people in puppets, puppeteering and all that. I pray against that all the time because that's the brokenheartedness that's used by the devil and devils. Even man has learned to use that. Okay, that's why the worship and then an offering because they can get more if you feel better. Okay, if you feel like you got touched by God, then guess what? You're going to give even more. But imagine if they did just preach the Word of God and then take an offering, what would happen? Most people would be upset because if it's a good teaching, you know, pretty good. Yeah. Anyhow, we're going to move on now. So all these restorations that have taken place, here comes Philip. So here is Philip. And the next thing we see, we see him in the book of Acts. And he's preaching Isaiah 61, or the ministry of Jesus Christ to the Ethiopian eunuch. Who's going to take it back to Ethiopia and cause an uprising of the Spirit of God to come and start converting? Ethiopia has been one of the greatest nations for God for generations. And then the Muslims moved in. That's why there's been so many famines in, in Ethiopia, because they let the devil push them through. The old churches became mosques. What do you think God's going to do? So we need to recognize that what happened next is, he says, is there any reason why I shouldn't baptize? So the guy says, let's get baptized. So he goes into the water with him, with the eunuch, and he baptizes him. So what happens next? The guy gets dumped, comes back up. Philip's gone. He came both out of the water and then suddenly Philip is gone. That's what I said, and Philip is gone. But what a testimony to that Ethiopian. Yeah. See, Jesus is our example, Mount Transfiguration. He went, to he went from physical to spirit to physical. So we need to recognize Peter was there. Peter represents the church, us. Okay? The body and bride of Christ represents that. So that's what was given to us by example. So here's Philip. Boom. He went from physical, God took him out of the water, because he just got baptized too. Okay? He was, the Holy Spirit was released to translate him. He was physical, became spirit, and found himself in another 
town physically. He wasn't just spiritual. He was physical. Now, I've experienced this. I know others who have experienced this. Very real. Uh, in fact, Bruce Allen, they were taking pictures one day and he started disappearing. It's in the picture. He's half gone. He'd been translated by God and he ended up going somewhere. I can't remember where he said he went, but he was on Sid Roth. But I know Bruce Allen. I grew up. My first four years of, of being with the Lord was going to his church, his father's church. So, the, the process that God has given us has not been used. Though it's released, God has had to hold back because of pride. God had to hold back lest he judges us. God does not want us prideful. He does not want us ignorant, but if we're not willing to die to self and step forward into what God has given us, why should he give us any more? He's not going to lay your stuff on us that we're going to get judged for. It. He won't do that. He loves us too much. But he will give us things to tease. So I'm going to just call it teasing. What is hunger? But a teasing. He'll give you a taste so you want more. And there's no sin in that. Because he does want more for us. Amen. Don't you want more than what you see in the church? Yeah. And in your own life? Oh, yeah. We should be out there just like Jesus. Everywhere we go, there should be miracles. Demons should be manifesting. It doesn't matter. Don't be afraid of what God gave us. Yeah. Amen. Period. God is sovereign. Yes, he is. God is sovereign. If you're enthroned with him, you better pay attention to what he's teaching you. How to rule and reign with him is walking like Jesus when he was here. By allowing him to walk through you. That's the greater things than these. How can any how can we how is it possible to do greater things than what Jesus did here? And we only get to see a few things compared to all the books that should be written. How is it possible? By Him doing them through us. It's the only way. So are you ready to start doing what Jesus did? Speaking what He did? Walking like He did? No matter what. Amen. I've been taught from day one, wherever you lay your head, that's your home for them. From day one, God has had me go from house to house. He calls me a spiritual midwife. Go work. Most places where God sends me, I'm there for nine months. Sometimes longer, especially if I get tired. He holds me back a little bit longer. Or in great warfare going on. In other words, there's a whole bunch of things happening all at once. Sometimes he'll leave me in a place longer. I think the longest I've ever been in one place was three years. But boy, what a warfare that went on. Whew. But that's also scripture. Scripture. We got to recognize who you are. I said we. I didn't say you. I said we. Because we're supposed to lift each other up because we're all in the same body. You see the one hand fight the other? Hmm. You know, people make a joke of it. It's no joke in the body of Christ. It needs to stop. Because if you talk against your brother or your sister, that's exactly what you're doing. And you're going to be accused of murder. And you hate your brother or your sister so much that you revile them behind your back. You talk about them behind your back to murder their character. That's the devil. That's Jezebel. Nebai. That's his name. Jezebel, Ahab wanted this particular vineyard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? And he couldn't get it. So what did he do? He went and got in his bed and was crying like a big baby. Whining and all kinds of other things. And what happened? Jezebel comes in and so she picks it up. Uses the king's name. Hello? You think that isn't happening in the church today? And in ministries? Oh yeah. But that's not God using them. That's them using God. Or making merchandise of God and the things of God. Just like when he turned over the tables and ran them out. with a, He built a whip and ran them out. Don't think he's, oh, you need to go now. You need to stop this. <laughs> no, I don't think so. He was angry. And it was a righteous anger because he cannot sin. And he got a point made. Because where that took place is called the land. Where that took place. 
We are the land. We're made of the land. And we're the ones who should be standing in front of God's people and proclaiming the glory or the truth of God to such a point that he turns over these money changers tables and is given back to the people. And all this garbage that's being spread out, these lies and stuff and some of these books need to be shut down and burned. Because some of them are full of witchcraft. The Bible talks about resting, W-R-E-S-T in the King James, the Word of God to their own destruction. That word rest, look it up sometime. I'll just simply say this, they twist, turn, or water down the Word of God to their own destruction. We need to recognize what has happened so God can use us to turn it upside down, which is right side up. Because right now the church is upside down. As a whole. And God's going to use us to turn it right side up. Over 15 years ago, the Lord asked me, because I've been in construction my whole life. And the Lord asked me, how would you like to help me rebuild my church? We're seeing that house in Bentley. Well, it's here. This has to take place before he starts bringing in the big harvest. We're not talking a few people. We're talking billions of people coming in worldwide. Where are they going to go? Who's going to feed them? They'll be made merchandise of. Paul talked about this very clearly, especially in Galatians. Who has beguiled you? Who's taking this? In other places, he talked about, watch out, they're going to steal, come to steal it from you. You've got to know who you are. But what's more important, you've got to know what God gave you because of who you are. You've got to know what you are because of Him, not you. Not because somebody else or something you're doing or whatnot. Not because of what you know. God have mercy. It's because of Jesus Christ and what He knows. And what He wants to do in you and then through you. Not you in Him or through Him. The opposite. The other way around. We're about to see great things happen. Creative miracles. We're about to see life and death. That's going to take place in this too. And the nice fire king here is going to happen again. And it's going to be on a scale. There will be no question it's God. Angels are going to start appearing just like devils will. It's in the book of Revelation. Go read it. They manifest. It's already beginning. And I think we're about to see a whole bunch of angels manifest in our, in, in, in our country, especially in Washington, D.C. Amen. I believe it's going to hit in other governments too. They're going to show up. And I believe people are going to die. And people are going to get to see it. And I believe it's going to be on TV. There will be no question they're holy Hallelujah. angels. Not devils. Holy angels. And the body of Christ and the right better make, make real sure that they understand. Do not call what's good evil or what's evil good. Light for dark, dark for light, bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. For such is the pride of man. That's Isaiah 520-21. We need to be very careful. As it said in James 1.19, be very swift to listen, very slow to speak, and very slow to anger. For the anger of, the, of, of yeah, man does not produce. Does not produce. You got it. Yeah. We got to get in these places. We got to get into Luke 10, 18 through 20. What God has given us, power over serpents and scorpions, and by no means that any devil can touch us. But do not rejoice that you have the power over these things, but rejoice because of Christ Jesus. I'm paraphrasing. So, who's the serpents and who are the scorpions? Very critical. We talked about transferring spirits and tagalongs. Okay? These are just very small things in the spirit of realm. Okay, you got to understand these things are real. There's a dual entity going on. You have the physical world, you have the spirit realm. They are parallel. You have a you have a physical bride a church and you have a spiritual bride in church, which is true. And they're going side they're parallel. One will not make it, the other already has. But God is trying to get them to cross over into the physical and start manifesting what's in the spirit. That's what Jesus did. He is spirit. He came here to become physical, to change the physical to spirit. But we have not got it. We are not spirit. We are spiritual. We are not spirit. That is the thousandfold anointing. 
to become spirit like Jesus. People do not understand Jesus could have left this earth any time he wanted. Mount Transfiguration proves that. But he chose to stay here for us. He was physical or spiritual who became spirit. He was spiritual who became physical because the physical world has not become spirit. So he came to change that with his name and his blood. That's why the Father, when he when he resurrected and ascended, that's what it was about. God took the physical and became spirit to come back and give us the spirit to change the physical. And that's what we're being called to do, to be the family of Jesus Christ so they can see Him and know Him for who and what He really is. Spirit and truth. The King of glory. Enthroned and glorified forever. Sovereign. But even the church does not honor Him with the fear of the Lord. It's not a fear that we know fear. It's a reverent awe of who He is. He is God. Period. And that's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira and King Herod. And by the way, Jesus ordered the Holy Spirit to take Ananias and Sapphira's breath in front of the church. And it got out into it. It, it. it brought fear upon all who saw it and all who heard or the community. King Herod, Jesus, he's the Lord of hosts. He sent an angel to torment Herod first and then kill him. In front of the people, he manifested. That's why I know it's going to happen again. Because this world is full of Herods, especially in this country. And there will be no question, because the fear of the Lord came upon the people when they saw their precious king killed by a physical angel. But Jesus ordered it. Jesus is the greatest act of love man will ever see, ever see. It was the unconditional love of the Father that he revealed. He was the unconditional and is the unconditional and always will be the unconditional love of the Father for us. Period. And he is so righteous. Or he is the one who will judge us in the end. But he's not going to judge us the way you think. The books of everything you thought, said, and done is written. It's like there's a book of remembrance of what you've done for the Lord. There's a book of remembrance about what you have decided and how you've chosen to do things. With the blood of the Lamb, when you ask God for forgiveness every single day, you ask the Father in the name of the Son to take the blood of the Lamb and wash you down. That is the greatest eraser in the world. When you stand before Jesus, I pray to God there is not one iota in your book other than the remembrance of the book of remembrance, the chapter that you possess, in that what God has done through you for the glory of His Son. And what you've given to the Holy Spirit to glorify Him. Literally. One of my greatest prayers, first of all, is mercy. Because I'm praying to the Father. Then I ask for compassion and grace from Jesus. Then I pray against the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because it's a play. I play to death. And I ask the Father to expose and reveal everything. So we can get right. Not to destroy. Not, not to condemn. No. Shame, guilt, and condemnation has no place in us. And if you have shame, guilt, or condemnation in any way, then you need to get before God and get right. And let him deliver you of it, because it's not of God. God does not give us shame, guilt, and condemnation, which is a three-strand unholy cord sought to destroy you, steal, kill, destroy, is a thief. And when the thief is found out, you have a right to proclaim the word of God and declare it must be everything stolen from you or destroyed or killed must be restored sevenfold. Now sevenfold is what God says, not what we think. It's not time seven. <laughs> it's much greater. Now you talk to Spirit. Purim was all about this. It was about freedom. And giving us a right to take on the devils and say no in the name of Jesus. That's what happened. So God can elevate us to a place of writing or proclaiming, speaking. Doing whatever God tells you to do with his proclamations, which is what Mordecai did. 
And the enemy will be caught in their own devices like Haman. He both Jezebel and Ahab were judged by God when they went after Naboth. Who was the keeper of the vineyard? We are keepers of the vineyard. Do you understand that? That is the garden of the Lord we're supposed to be working in. Tending to. Protecting. Doing whatever God asks you to do. And everybody is different. That's why we all need each other. We are a bond. We're the family of God. And together we have to do this. That's why God sends us to Washington. And back here, we're going back. We're networking. We're sowing together two families in the spirit realm. What God gives us in Washington, this is what you're getting today. God released these things in Washington. He said, take them to Illinois. We took them here. we got to go back to Washington on April 1st. Pray for us. We have to go back on the 1st. By the way, the 1st of every month is a new shift in the spirit realm. That's how fast things are moving. Usually it was just maybe three or four years. Now it's a minimum of 12. And that doesn't mean there's not other shifts taking place. But this is in the mo actual movement. So God says he's going to send us back there. We've got to be back there for many reasons. But we've got to go back and find out what's next. And bring it back here. So we've been spending a month there and two months here. So that's the four seasons. Every season has its purpose. And God is changing and shifting things. And what happens here with what God releases, we're taking back to Washington and doing war with it. And believe me, they're not happy. Now you know why our cars are being destroyed. Why everything that the devil can do to try and get us to stop is being done. But we will not stop. And I know she's in one accord with me. We will not stop. No matter what the devil does, no matter how we feel, no matter what happens to us, we will not stop. Because we've been asked by the Lord to do this. I don't know any other life anymore. But Jesus Christ. So, He must be your life. He must not just be a figurehead. He must be your head. And the head will tell the body what to do. That's what the Holy Spirit is used for. And if you look at your body, you'll see the kingdom of heaven. The Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, coming to the body to release what God wants to do. The nervous system is the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. The blood is the releasing of breath and manna to feed the body like we're doing today. The lungs, double portion, cloven tongues. Do you understand? That's the breath of God and of the Son. It's the Holy Spirit and fire being released. Your heart, the blessings going in and out of you, in and out of you, in and out of you. Every breath you take goes into your heart, goes out in your blood. The, the heart is a stringed instrument. It creates worship. When you honor in God, you will worship. The Holy Spirit will cause you to worship in ways you never worshiped before. And sometimes you only have to sing. Just sit in the presence of God. And let the angels sing while you're sitting with Jesus. And He's loving on you. If you're going to walk the walk, you better be ready to do the talk. And if you're going to do the talk, you better be ready to do the walk. Because they're synonymous. Because that's Jesus Christ. Prayer is so critical. Because it began with a fast. You know, it began with a, yes, Lord, here I am. That's how it started. Yes, Lord, here I am. And then the leader, Esther, got everybody and sent out word to do a three-day fast, no food or water. And believe me, it can be done if it's God. And as soon as I got saved, it's the first thing he taught me. He took me right there. I had no idea what the Bible was. He took me there, and boom. There it was. 4 verse 10, if I remember right. So all I saw was Esther. And I, 410, if I remember, somebody look up Esther 410. It's about the three day fast, if I remember right. And that's how God taught me. And I do two of those fasts a week. 
or I mean warfare. While he used it to change me, I was doing warfare to change anything and everyone. Because I pray there's no boundaries on any prayer. You should make the same covenant with God. No matter what God has you pray. No matter what he has you proclaim and declare. No boundaries, Lord. Use it wherever you want, however you want, on whoever or whatever you want. No boundaries. In the name of Jesus. Just go up by your son. I don't ask God yes and no question. No. Ask God for his will to be done. Ask him, what is your will, Lord? What? Oh, better yet, ask the Lord, what would you like to say to me? It will stop your spirit and other spirits from getting involved with your answer, which can be confusing sometimes. Another thing that can happen, and this happened with me, and this is how I learned these things by experience, is we were asking the Lord one day, we were in this meeting, me and a sister in the Lord, and, and this is in Alaska, and we were asking God, if we, she felt we were supposed to go back, and I said, Lord, are we supposed to go back? And I heard yes, and she got no. Well, don't think that didn't cause a little wrinkle. Yeah. Because we both know we heard from the Lord. I know her, and I trusted her, and she knew me, and she trusted me. And both were true. Yes. But it took prayer to find out. God, He was giving us wisdom. He, this is what God will do. He will cause you to believe something's wrong, when all He wants to do is give you some wisdom, and that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, we ought to go back, but no, not yet. Timing. Yes. It was timing. Which is just as critical as the word itself. God's timing was perfect. And if you don't think so, go look at the walk of Jesus Christ. Everything was perfectly timed. Everybody was in position. Everything that was supposed to take place took place. Everything. Because God doesn't just answer your prayers for you or for somebody else. He answers prayers for the greatest amount of people he can bless with the greatest amount of blessings he can give. So don't think your prayers are proof of if you don't see anything. Because God will also protect us from pride. What if he answered every prayer we had in front of us? Huh? You're going to sit there and tell me that you wouldn't have a touch of pride in that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm special. <laughs> but we do have the favor of the Lord, and yes, we are favorites because of Jesus Christ. But God protects us. As he once told me, he said, when he showed me everything that was going to happen and all that, and the Lord said to me, he says, I'm not going to let you see everything happen in front of you. He says, once in a while I'll let you see to encourage you. But believe when you walk away, I'm going to do something. Mm. Whether you get to see it or not, I'm going to do something. Whether it's in the spirit realm, the physical realm, or the emotional realm, I'm going to do something. Don't matter. Just trust in that. I heard you and I will do something. Because you asked me in the name of my son. I heard you. Because Jesus said whatsoever you ask the Father in my name. Amen. Now sometimes we run into things. You know and the devil had a hole in my throat one day. I woke up and the devil had his claws in my throat and I couldn't talk. And here's all these demons around him. Like this. Half moon shape. And I couldn't talk, and I looked at the Lord, and the Holy Spirit says, Jesus. So I couldn't speak. So I fought it in my heart. Jesus. He had to let go. Mm. And he turned to all these demons. He goes, oh, we'll come back to this one later. <laughs> they were all the strong men from the Middle East, and he was the star in the crescent moon. Wow. The Lord gave me that revelation. Go, oh, wow, Lord. He says, yeah, now you know who your adversary is and don't fear him. Don't ever fear him. Be yeah. like Smith Wilbur. Oh, it's just you. <laughs> yeah. It's just you. That's all you got. <laughs> he has no power. He has no power. He got cast from standing up to his belly. That's why God called him a serpent. And at the time, it's true. He was cast to his belly. He could not stand up anymore. He was cast to his back. Which means Jesus put his foot on him and made him submit. Do you understand what just got said to you? Yeah. We have the power to do this. When you, when you take a foot, and any, anybody who's ever been in war or anything else, you put your foot on some, on a head or a neck, that's victory. 
And you made that individual or that thing submit. That's what Jesus did to Satan. Because the neck at the time was considered that part of the head. But by putting his foot there, he bruised his heel. Boom. Satan is a reed. He cannot talk. Interesting, isn't it? If he tries to, all that comes out is worship. He's a wind instrument. Like a clarinet and some of these other, you know, you put a little reed in there. And you blow on it, it vibrates. It causes the sounds to come out with the thing. So every time Satan tries to open his mouth, all that comes out is the worship of God. Why? Because he used to be the angel in charge of the worship of God at his throne. He was known as Lucifer then. Or beautiful one. But when he chose to rebel, he lost his name, he lost his title, he lost his position and his countenance. And anybody that went with him, also they lost their countenance. They were all beautiful angels till they fell. Now they live in darkness. They can't stand the light. They can't stand worship from the heart. So any demons around this area, I don't care who they are, I don't care where they were, they were sick while we were singing, if nothing else. Hallelujah. We were being touched and released. The demons, well, they were getting touched too. Because God showed me one day, I was worshiping the Lord, and I got this image of this demon bent over. It's like, you know, you ever had the stomach flu? Huh? It's bad. Or food poisoning? You can't stand up. Well, in this worship, I saw this, and I said, Lord, what just happened? He says, devils cannot handle worship from the heart, worshiping me. You cannot worship something you do not love. And when you worship with love, the devils are folded over. They will run. And the whole area was cleared. And they have not been allowed back yet. And I'm praying that they're not allowed back at all. Amen. And everybody in these complexes across the street and everywhere, and anybody that drives through, they all get their deliverance and receive Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And they shake their heads and say, what just happened? Jesus Christ just happened. Yes. I do the same thing when I go out walking, prayer walking stuff. I rub my feet. Usually I'll put it on the ground and I step them. I rub my feet so it gets rubbed into the ground. And wherever I walk, I said, Lord, wherever I walk, I'm dripping oil. And whoever steps in that oil or let the name of Jesus rise up until they come to you, don't let them have peace or rest until they do eternally. Not just come to you, eternally. Which means to receive Jesus Christ with no turning back. Amen. There's all kinds of stuff we could do. You got creditors calling you? Preach to them. I'm serious. Yeah, yeah we we'll gonna sit there and listen or hang up on you. Yeah, I was pretty You're not put up with them. Well, yeah. Sure it's woman. That's not your dead anyhow, belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We're members of the body of Christ, right? If he's the head, are they not his debt? It's not this a, that's what Sean and I we live on this fact. And when we need something, God gives it to us. I didn't say what. Well, once in a while he gives us what we want, but because everything we get, we give to God. Every penny is accountable to God. Everything we do, accountable to God. The car, it's his. He's going to have to do it, figure out what he's going to do with it. We just walked us out. And if we needed something, people stand up. And they come forward, like, like Peter. David, I'm letting us use his car. The black and Lincoln out there. We didn't even ask. They called us. No. They put us on their insurance before we ever got back here. Back the last time we were here, they put us on it and they kept it going. You never know what God's going to do. We're moving to Rockford. Okay, on Monday. So we've been at Patadante's house. God opened that up. So we went from there to pass to have a vacation, God said. I said, God, all these people are going on vacation. He said, What do you think you're on? <laughs> I used to say, what's the vacation? Well, I know now. We got to look after and have, have fun with her two kittens, yeah. her two cats. And we had fun with them. They actually have started to have fun with us, too. But we got a time to rest. Now that we're going. Yeah. It's like having a teenager. <laughs> no offense, teenagers. We understand. We've been there, too. We just forget what it was like. 
But there was, it, it's a place of rest. It's a place of, of, you know, in the war. The Father promises in Hebrews, rest to those in Christ Jesus. And we got some rest. And so we do get tired, especially during the warfare we do and stuff, especially going, and the devil doesn't like us, period. But we're dealing with Seattle and Chicago board, then the states. And they're both evil and wicked. Seattle has just been hidden until COVID. Because of COVID, it got them noticed. Now Chicago's always been open. Okay? They're one and the same, believe it or not, they are. And God is going to use these two ungodly things, portals, to hell. And he's going to expose them and take them over himself. My cry is that you don't have, he doesn't have to destroy them first. I'm praying for Chicago, which I prayed clear back in 2017 when I was here, when the first time I came here. Do you know Chicago was just named the most violent city in the United States? Yeah, well, they've got lots of titles. But the key in it is, is, is prophets have been seeing fire. And I saw a big, like an atomic mushroom come up and I said, well, oh, God, because he had me, took me to Lake Michigan right there on the shore and one foot in the water, one foot on the land and pro do all kinds of stuff. But the that was in uh, June of 2017. And God, I saw these waves of fire coming. And, and it is coming. And it is coming. And what happened was I said, Lord, because I started hearing all these, what these other properties, people are telling me what these other, all other properties are talking about it being destroyed. I said, Lord, I, I don't want you to destroy it. I want you to destroy every demon in the city and what's going on in Chicago land. And let the worship of God go up and let the earth turn and save everybody. Every single person. Amen. By destroying Amen. every single devil. In the land, on the land, or around the land. Which not means physical, but also means people. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine Chicago with no demons in it? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. <laughs> and everybody singing together, wow. yes. which is what the mayor tried to stop <laughs> in the parts of stuff. You know what I'm now, can you imagine this? Can you imagine? I mean, what a vision. I'm not saying it's from God, but it's in my heart. And I still thank God for it, because I know God can do it if He wants to. Amen. I don't know what His will is. He hasn't told me. But what if God was to destroy every demon? Literally. Not just in Chicago, but what about Seattle also? Which is basically the new Russia. I'm serious. It just... Imagine both cities... Getting saved, everybody in the cities getting saved and around the cities and every demon destroyed and killed, mm. annihilated and holy fire. All at the same time. Mm. Wow. You tell me that is going to shake the world? Everybody knows these two cities worldwide. But imagine if God was to do that. I'm just saying. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for all these things, Lord. And you did give us power over the enemy by proclamation, declaration from your throne, just like a perm. Lord, now teach us how to do warfare that we forgot to do. Mm -hmm. It's like Israel. They forgot how to do the warfare from all the war, the, kind of, uh, the Canaan wars, Lord God. And you came in and you began to teach them the warfare they forgot. I believe that's Judges 3 or 6, somewhere in there. And Lord, I pray right now, retrain your body and bride to recognize one thing. The Word of God hasn't changed. Neither have you. They changed. They changed the Word of God. And I'm asking you, Lord, to remove those things that are offensive to you, Lord God, and cause them, Lord, to bow to you in repentance. Cause them to turn and convert, O Lord God. Cause them to lay down all the mammon, which is self, Lord, and take up the cross. For you, Lord Jesus. Father, we cry out for you as with all things to forgive us of our sins, Lord God, and cleanse us with the blood of Jesus as you use his name to forgive us. In Jesus' name we ask these things. And to purge us with the fire of your Holy Spirit. Get into the deep areas, Lord, the things that we don't want to talk about, the things we definitely do not want to look at. Change us, Lord, by taking these things out of us, Lord. Deliver us, Lord God.
Lord, you are not just our Lord, you are deliverer. You're the lover of our souls. You are the great physician. Do whatever you need to do to get us in a place you need us to be in. And want us in, oh God, for your glory, always for your glory. We thank you for this time, Lord. Let these messages go out without any interference whatsoever. And anybody who seeks to, to destroy, stop, hurt, or whatever, Lord, touch them. Touch them, Lord. Do a job on them. 33, 14 through 33, Lord God. That in their sleep, when they won't listen to you during the day and receive what you or what you have to say, speak to them in their sleep. Do not let them have rest. Let them toss and turn until they receive what you have to say. Get beyond their pride, Lord God, and bring them into the kingdom eternally. We bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for all that you have been doing, are doing, and especially for what you're about to do. Let us stay focused on you, Lord Jesus, by your Holy Spirit and not what's going on. Do not let us become political adversaries, Lord God, but let us become faithful servants, obeying you and what you want from us. Not what we want by using you, but what you want by using us, Lord God. There is much more to be done here, Lord God. Keep us focused on you, on your will to be done, and on your word and the releasing of that word, and the praying and doing warfare for the lost, Lord preparing them to come in in this harvest, Lord God, to your glory, where you are worthy. We thank you for this time. Traveling mercies for all, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.